I usually wait until Richie turns on the camera back there. A preacher fell into the ocean and he couldn't swim. When a boat came by, the captain yelled, do you need help, sir? And the preacher said, no, God will save me. A little later, another came by and a fisherman says, do you need help? The preacher replied again, no, God will save me. Eventually the preacher drowned and he went to heaven and he asked God, why didn't you save me? And God said, you idiot, I sent you two boats. <laughs> Mark chapter 3, starting with verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around, and around Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon, by the way, was, was ancient Phoenicia, um, north of Israel. It's, Tyre and Sidon is today's Lebanon, where Hezbollah is. Um, I think Phoenicia were, is where they first discovered glass. I think I've read that in history. But the evil queen Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbal, the king of Sidon. So she was a Sidonian princess. She supported the prophets of Baal, and the work, worship of Baal involved infant sacrifice. They burned babies alive. And they did that to, to the to uh, Chemosh and Molech, those other two evil, detestable gods of the Canaanites. Continuing in verse 9, because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you as having been entrusted with these morsels from your word. We entrust you to guide this word into the hearts where you want it to go and that will affect the change that you want it to affect. We give ourselves to you and we confess our hunger for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And then in Mark chapter 35, chapter 435 to 41, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. So that day, in Mark chapter 4, and starting with verse 1 again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. This is what that day was like for him. The crowd was gathered around him, was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out in the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. Jesus taught by the lake on that day from a boat. He taught them the parable about the seeds. He taught about the lamp on a lampstand. He taught the parable of the mustard seed. That was the day that this all happened. He probably taught many things that we don't even know about. That day was like so many other days to him. Crowds always pressed around him, mostly because he demonstrated his power to heal them. And they were awed by that, plus they, were, they needed healing. And because he was able to cast out demons, demons are real. The world would have you think that they're not, but they are. And because he was able to cast out demons, he was a powerful influence in the lives of these people in these crowds. Unlike the ruling elites, the Pharisees, and teachers of the law, he loved the people. And he said, let's go to the other side. Verse 36, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. I think that's interesting. So they took him along. And then just as he was. I never thought too much about that until I was seeking for this sermon. But in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. 
That's in the first chapter of Gospel of John. The common people could feel there was something different and powerful about him, so they crowded around him. And this is they took him. He asked, let's go to the other side. He needed to get away. Have you ever been there, needing to get away? The press of the crowd was oppressive to him. They pressed against him. And it says they took him just as he was. He was exhausted. He needed to get away. He needed his friends to take over. The boat was probably Peter's. He was a fisherman. He had boats. I don't think that he would steal somebody else's boat. He said, get a small boat ready for me. So a clue to his exhausted condition uh, was that he fell asleep in the stern of the boat. That's a clue. He was exhausted. They took him just as he was. And what was that? He was exhausted from all that he had done that day. And he fell asleep. Sleep on a cushion, it says. I don't know exactly what that was. Some commenters, commentators say it was a wooden pillow, but it says a cushion. But it must have been something that was common in a fishing boat. It doesn't seem like it would be very comfortable to sleep on, unless you're really really tired and could sleep just about anywhere. People in, in the military have experiences like that in, in a battlefield. They get so exhausted, they can sleep leaning up in a corner, don't they? I mean, that's tiring. More evidence of his exhaustion. Even a storm rocking the boat didn't wake him up. That's really exhaustion. I mean, I can shake the bed a little bit. My wife will wake up. But if she's really exhausted, she probably wouldn't. But Jesus was really exhausted. Only the hands and voices of the others in the boat could wake him up. And then it says there were other boats. Apparently, some of the crowd didn't want to be away from him. So they got into some other boats that were there so as to continue to be near him. And then in verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. There must have been some spray or some water that spilled over that, but even that didn't wake him up. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? In verse 39, he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. I'm trying to get some sleep over here. That's the, that's the sense of it. When the wind died down, it was completely calm. Nature obeys him. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? In verse 41, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They must not have had a complete, full understanding, even though they were his disciples of how much power he had and exactly who he was just yet. But after Jesus began his public ministry, he was like a modern day rock star. People thronged around him wherever he went. News spread that he had the power to heal, to cast out demons, to bring light where there was darkness, to bring light into people's lives, to bring hope <clears throat> where there was despair, and to teach powerful truths wherever he went. Jesus was God and didn't have to do any of this. He was also fully man. He was fully God and he was fully man. He got hungry just like the rest of us. He experienced grief 
just like the rest of us. He was grieved when his friend Lazarus died. Jesus wept. That was when he went to the tomb of Lazarus. Deeply moved, he ordered the stone to be rolled away. Deeply moved. He experiences that grief just like we do. Deeply moved, and it was his friend. Jesus knew what it was like to toil as a carpenter. Growing up, he learned that from Joseph. People apprenticed to their fathers, and they did what their fathers did. So his, he knew how to work wood. He no doubt smashed his thumb a couple of times. I was working wood when I chopped the end of my thumb off. <laughs> Thumbs get in the way sometimes. But he knew how to work hard. He knew what it was to accomplish a goal, to get things done by working hard. But he knew what it was to work hard and sweat and work and toil. He knew what that was, just like we do. He came here from glory. He came from heaven. His life was splendor, and he was the creator, John 1, 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. He loved us so powerfully that he gave up, that he gave that, that up, they gave up that splendor for a while to come here to dwell among sinful man, to subject himself to rejection, to be renounced, denounced, tormented by the very people he came to save. He allowed himself to be tortured and crucified to provide atonement for sinners like me and like you. Second Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He took the sins of all mankind onto himself on the cross. He became the ultimate sacrifice. No one else could do that. No one else lived a perfect life worthy of that sacrifice. He made a way where there seemed to be no way for us to escape perdition, the flames of hell, in other words. During his three years of public ministry, people thronged around him constantly. As soon as it became known that he was able to do for them what no one else could do, the crowds would not leave him alone. We only have a glimpse of how exhausting his ministry was in this example of falling asleep in the boat, being weary from that full day's worth of ministry that he had done and from the crowds pressing against him. No matter how exhausted Jesus was, he still blessed people. He still caused the blind to see. He still caused the lame to walk. He still healed lepers. He still taught victorious, soul-saving truth. His weary, toilsome ministry was available to all, even in those crowds. So we need to know that, one, Jesus didn't live a life of luxury. He lived and moved among the common people. He was God's son, and he was God. He could have lived any way he wanted. He chose to be born of a homeless couple. He chose to fall, follow his father's earthly trade. He chose to earn a living by hard work, like the ordinary folks of that time. He didn't have to do it that way. And know that number two, Jesus knows firsthand what you are going through. He knows your pain because he experienced pain. Probably more than us, any, any of us will ever experience. He knows about your pain because he was in pain 
terrible, terrible pain. He knows how your headache feels. He knows how your stomach ache feels. He knows what a backache feels like. On the cross, everything was in pain. You can't have pain anywhere that he doesn't know from his personal experience. Think about that. He knows what it's like when you are too tired to continue. He's been there. He's done that. Know that, number three, Jesus knows what, what your pain, the pain of your grief, is like. He knows how your heartache is like. He knows that. He grieved over his friend. He grieved over Jerusalem. Luke 19, 41 and 44, as he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. He wept over it and said, if you, even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build, will build an embankment against you and encircle you, hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Of course, that's what happened in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. The judgment that mankind brings upon itself causes Jesus to grieve. The grief of the widow at Nain touched the heart of Jesus. He had times when he was grieved, but here's someone else's grief that touches his heart, just like your grief does. Luke 7, starting with verse 11, says, Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain. That town is still there, by the way. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. A large crowd following along. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. Picture this. A happy, victorious crowd, crowd coming with Jesus, and a sad, grieving crowd coming out of the city following the funeral procession. And when Jesus saw her, verse 13, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Her grief touched the heart of Jesus. Then he went up and touched the bier where they were carrying him. And the bearer stood still and he said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. Wouldn't you like to know what he was saying? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know what he said? And Jesus gave him back to his mother. The grief of this poor mother touched the heart of Jesus. Don't cry. We can almost feel the compassion in his words. Don't cry. The mother would have been destitute. She was a widow. No son, no husband in that culture. There was no hope for her. Because if there was no husband, father, son, there would be no support. That's the way it was back then. Jesus knew that his own mother would experience a mother's grief when he went to the cross. Know that it grieves Jesus when we reject him. This next paragraph is from Greg Lowry, and he writes, Jesus also wept because his ministry was almost over. Time was short. He had healed their sick. He had raised their dead. He had cleansed their lepers. He had, felt, uh, he had fed their hungry. He had forgiven their sins. Yet for the most part, he had been rejected. John 1.11 says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. And so he wept. This broke his heart. And it still does. Unbelief. And rejection breaks God's heart because he knows the consequences. But when the door of the human heart is shut, he refuses to enter forcibly. 
He will only knock, waiting to gain admittance. He has given us the ability to choose. But when we choose the wrong thing, he knows the repercussions that will follow in this life and in the one to come, and his heart is broken. Number five, know that our sin has caused Jesus to suffer. It was my sin that caused him to be nailed to the cross. Not only my sins, but yours also. In fact, all of the sins of mankind caused the pain in the nails and the crown and all the rest of it. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He took our sins onto himself on the cross and made atonement for us all. 2 Corinthians 5.14 and 15, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and, nor, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So Christ, the holy anointed one of God, died for all. No one could be forgiven outside of Jesus. And faith in him as Savior and as Lord. God's grace is available to all. But sadly, most reject his love and his salvation. And this grieves Jesus. Jesus was fully God and fully man. A person with a human nature. And he, and, and he was... He, he experienced what we experience. He had joy. He had sorrow. He had pain. He had extreme fatigue from his toils. He knew what it was like to be exhausted. Slept right through the storm. As God, he had many victories. The blind healed, lame walked, dead raised. Sinners set free from the law of sin and death. We can all claim that, can't we? He had strength as a man. He has power as God. He was the only hope for mankind. No other sacrifice could satisfy as atonement because he lived the only perfect sinless life that was ever lived. He was the perfect spotless lamb we don't think of jesus as human we don't think of him as one who was weary we don't think of him as one who could be exhausted he had the same pains and emotional concerns that we have he gets us rejoicing happens in heaven when when, when a sinner comes to the fold, rejoicing happens in heaven. The way the world is going, I'm convinced, is a source of grief to Jesus. He's joyful when we open the door of our life to him, when we accept him as Lord and Savior and live for him. He died for us, so let's live for him. Let's get in to his boat. <laughs> Whose boat are you in? Is he in your boat? Let's get into his boat. Amen? Amen. Would you stand? Father God, it's been good to be in your house. It's been good to be with people of like precious faith and to share this word and to worship you, Lord. And now as we go our separate ways, we pray that we'll hide this word in our hearts that we might not sin against you and that we might be made more profitable servants for you, Lord. So be with us as we go our separate ways, Lord, and bring us all back safely next time we meet in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings to you all.